as a teacher and as a legislator. Paul Douglas has always been one who has stood often alone to remind us of the unfulfilled promises of our heritage. He continues his work now as chairman of this commission on urban problems. So I'm delighted to be, have an opportunity to appear before his commission and appear before all of you. I've greatly admired the chairman for many, many years as he was admired and respected and had uh, the uh, strong affection of President Kennedy. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to appear before him and uh, those with whom he's serving. This summer, we have seen violence erupt in our cities, taking dozens of lives, destroying billions of dollars worth of property. And hopefully, the worst has passed. Surely, we cannot tolerate this wanton killing and burning. Clearly, those who destroy must feel the full force of the law. But surely, but just as surely, just as clearly, it is fruitless simply to quell the explosions without attacking the roots. This violence is not simply an aimless burst of savagery, nor the product of outside agitators. It is brutal evidence of our failure to deal with the crisis of urban America and of our failure to bridge the widening gap between the affluent and the poor, between black and white Americans. Through the eyes of the white majority, and if he does, he has an even chance of requiring as much as the equivalent of an eighth grade education. A young college graduate who taught in a ghetto school sums it up this way. The books are junk, the paint peels, the cellar stinks, the teachers call you nigger, and the window falls on your head. For the rest of life also, there are statistics. A quarter of a million Puerto Rican school children in New York City, of whom only 37 went to college last year, infant mortality at twice the normal rate. And because of inadequate diets and medical care, mental retardation at seven times the community average. As he progresses through school, it gradually, cruelly becomes clear to him that fewer and fewer jobs are available. For the people of the ghetto live today with an unemployment rate far worse than the rest of the nation do, knew during the depth of the Great Depression of the 1930s. And, and Mr. Chairman, as you know so well, the problems are increasing. Since the 1960 census, what special studies we have indicate that the problem is not eased. Indeed, there are indications that it has grown far worse. <clears throat> the most comprehensive of these special studies, carried out by Professor Charles Abrams, revealed that in New York City, the number of unsound housing units rose from 420,000 in 1960 to 525,000 in 1965. That is, as columnist Murray Kempton observed, New York acquired enough new substandard units, quote, to house the entire population of Trenton, New Jersey, in splendid misery. Still, there is no reason to think New York is unique. Indeed, in those years, and sweeping changes in the economy have turned the center city into a trap, an airtight cage, as one writer has called it. And the slums spread, and the city withers. Those with means flee to the suburbs, and the jobs follow them. The tax base of the city is eroded just when the physical decay has made it more urgent than ever to find the resources and to find them now. Our answers to this crisis in housing, in employment, in education have been inadequate. We simply have not done enough. In part, this is a test for these proposals lies ahead, and victory is in doubt. The shortcomings in our government programs, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, credits, accelerated depreciation, and extra deductions as effective and as comprehensive as those that we now offer for the production of oil or the building of grain storage facilities or the supersonic transport. Just as the investment credit of eliminate the necessity for the administration's rack control and extermination program, for decay will remain for many years for all of the residents of our urban ghettos. 
and they will continue to feel threatened so long as they know that they and their children may still be subject to attack from rats. Nor do these programs preclude the possibility of further governmental effort. For example, you suggested the other day, Mr. Chairman, one possibility which in my judgment deserves serious consideration. The use of suburban homes on which FHA mortgages have been foreclosed to house low-income families. Similarly, the administration's announcement last week of plans for a new community on surplus federal land in the District of Columbia and its intention to explore like possibilities elsewhere are welcome signs. But no government program can substitute for the skills and the resources that private enterprise can bring to bear on the problem of urban poverty. These are the skills and the resources that S2100 would bring to bear in the urban slums and the skills and the resources that are so desperately needed. The bill presents a new approach, infinitely expandable, to create low-income housing units so badly needed in the major cities of the nation. The bill has 11 basic features. First, the bill encompasses not only the building of new units. Second, cities will have primary control over it. New York did more to clear slums and build new low-rent housing than any other city in the country. We have known of this disgrace since the cities were born. We have been shocked at the filth amid wealth since Jacob Rees awakened New York at the turn of the century. And government at all levels has mounted program after program to erase this scar on the souls of the people. We have torn slums down, but others have risen in their places. We have tried to rehabilitate them, and this decay has outstripped repairs. We have built blocks of public housing, and they have become the new slums of the core city, slums which lack even that sense of neighborhood that the poor once had. And in recent years, an exploding population are not merely financial. Public housing, welfare systems, federal employment programs, these have just not worked fast enough, nor have they worked well enough to ease the mounting urban crisis. What must be done is to turn the power and the resources of our private enterprise system to the undeveloped nation within our midst. This should be done by bringing into the ghettos themselves productive and profitable private industry, creating dignified jobs, not welfare handouts, for the men and the youth now who languish in idleness. To do this, private enterprise will require incentives.